I'm going to talk about the past, present, and future of evidence-based medicine. I'm going to start by giving my impression of what evidence-based medicine is. Um, I'm going to talk about what I think are the three key principles of evidence-based medicine, and I'm going to use a historical approach. And in that historical approach, you're going to meet a number of people who have been key players in the development and evolution of evidence-based medicine. I'm going to describe that evolution, and then I'm going to focus on how EBM has responded in the time of COVID. So first person I would like to introduce you to is David Sackett. David Sackett was my mentor um, in EBM and he was the mentor of a number of other uh, EBM leaders. And one of his contributions was to make the first serious go at how one judges the credibility of the evidence. And he identified various sources of evidence, including clinical experience. Our clinical experience is one legitimate source of evidence. Basic research, observational studies looking at patient important outcomes, all of which have their limitations. And then at the top of this hierarchy, randomized trials, uh, which ensure prognostic balance between groups, and if blinded and achieving complete or near complete follow-up, give us unbiased estimates of treatment effects. This was a very useful hierarchy that served us well for some time, but it was perhaps overly simple. And later on in this talk, I'm going to tell you about a new, more comprehensive hierarchy that evidence-based medicine is now using. Second person I would like you to introduce to introduce you to is Ian Chalmers. Ian Chalmers had the idea um, that we should bring together, as suggested by his mentor Archie Cochran, bring together all the randomized trials uh, known to humankind and summarize them in systematic reviews. The vision of the Cochrane collaboration. And it was his Cochrane collaboration was his idea, not only his idea, but he did the groundwork that got the Cochrane collaboration going. And this slide to me captures nicely the necessity for systematic reviews. This is a uh, forest plot, but a special forest plot of a cumulative meta-analysis. So it's a cumulative meta-analysis of thrombolytic therapy after myocardial infarction. And I'm going to move some of what is blocking the top of the slide for a moment, um, just to show you, let's see, I can't move that, I'm afraid. Anyway, I can't see in the screen because of what's the, of the various things that are blocking the first randomized trial of uh, uh, thrombolytic therapy, uh, which showed a very wide confidence interval. The second trial did not enroll 65 patients, nor the third trial 149. This is a cumulative meta-analysis, which looks at the total of all patients who are enrolled up to a certain point. And you can see up to seven trials with under 2,000 patients, the confidence interval still overlaps no effect. We are still uncertain of the effect of thrombolytic therapy. By 2,500 patients in 10 trials, and there's no more overlap of the, con of the confidence intervals with no effect. And the question starts to arise, have we answered that thrombolytic therapy reduces deaths after myocardial infarction? Well, we could talk about when the answer was in, but I think most of us by 30 trials in over 6,000 patients, when the upper boundary of the confidence interval is a long way from no effect, when we're getting into very low p-values, we have an answer that thrombolytic therapy reduces deaths after myocardial infarction by about 25%. Did that stop people? 
from doing randomized trials of thrombolytic therapy? No, it did not. And there were another 40,000 patients enrolled after the answer was in, half of whom did not receive the benefits, the life prolonging benefits of thrombolytic therapy. And in the end, we have an extraordinary tight confidence interval with an extraordinary low p-value. And the question then arises, why did we have to enroll another 40,000 patients after the answer was in? The answer to that question, I think, or at least part of the answer, is on the right side of this slide, which shows what experts were saying as these uh, data were accumulating in their articles and textbooks and their journal articles. And the experts, some of them were saying thrombolytic therapy for routine use, some specific, some calling it experimental and some not even mentioning it. And what you see when you look here in the uh, latter part of the 1980s, you were seeing some experts calling it routine, but some were saying for specific indications, some still calling it experimental and some not mentioning it. Wide expert disagreement. And uh, it was a decade after the answer was in that the experts finally are coming to a consensus that thrombolytic therapy is a good idea. And that is why the trialists just kept doing trials because the experts were not convinced. Here, I'm going to show you a second example. It also comes from patients with myocardial infarction. And if we go back 45 years, 45 years ago, I was a resident in the Toronto training system, and I did a rotation through the cardiac care unit at the Toronto Western Hospital. <coughs> Excuse me. And when I did this rotation, every patient who came through the door, I started what we called a lidocaine drip, an intravenous infusion of lidocaine. Why? because we knew people after myocardial infarction were at risk of lethal arrhythmias and lidocaine was a nice antiarrhythmic agent. But was there ever any evidence supporting the use of lidocaine the way I was using it? And the answer is from randomized trials, there was never any evidence. This cumulative meta-analysis shows that the point estimates were always on the harm side. Increased deaths, not decreased, when we use lidocaine in patients after myocardial infarction. Never proved harm, but certainly ended up excluding any possible benefit. Well, what was happening as these data were accumulating into expert recommendations? Well, as it turned out, the majority of experts, as you see in the right side of this slide, were recommending giving lidocaine. That's why I was giving it to the patients I was looking after in the coronary care unit. Although once again, you see expert disagreement, some saying, most saying yes, some saying no, some not even mentioning the uh, lidocaine infusion. So once again, you have expert uh, disagreement and you have experts not only behind the times, but making recommendations contradicted by the evidence. Now, these are old stories. They ended around 1990. Experts still get things wrong and they still disagree, but perhaps not quite as badly as the stories that I showed you. And I think part of the reason that the problems aren't as bad is something that happened in 1990. What happened around 1990 that changed the picture and led to problems, to problems not being as severe as the ones that I showed you? What do you think? Anybody have a suggestion? Someone in the online chat, do you have uh, an idea about what happened? Or alguien in the chat in line tiene una idea que pasó que hizo que en los noventas cambiara uh, la preocupación que hubo sobre el uso de evidencia? Okay, well, if nobody has a suggestion, I will tell you my suggestion, which is that around 1990, 
you saw the first systematic reviews that were published. Now, um, those of you who are young probably think systematic reviews have been around for a century, and that's not the case. It was around 1990. There before about 1990, there were none or virtually no systematic reviews being published, and in 1990 they started. I would suggest that if the experts had seen the evidence summarized in systematic reviews that I have shown you, they would have come much more quickly to a consensus that thrombolytic therapy was a good idea, and they would have abandoned much, certain much, more, much earlier uh, the cytokine to reduce mortality after myocardial infarction. So, third person that I want to introduce you to is Brian Haynes. Brian Haynes was the chair of what was then the Department of Clinical Epidemiology, uh, which I was then a member for a decade and made very important contributions to evidence-based medicine, including thinking of the idea of how do we make clinical decisions? And he suggested that evidence doesn't make decisions, people do. And uh, in this article, the subtitle of which, Evidence Does Not Make Decisions People Do, published in the BMJ in uh, June 2002, he emphasized that, uh, uh, that not only evidence, but values and preferences. And I'm going to tell you about a study that was done by, led by PJ Devereux, who since that time has become the world leader in uh, management of uh, cardiovascular risk in patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. But in this case, he did a study in which he presented to physicians and patients the following situation. Patients with atrial fibrillation, high risk of stroke. Uh, this particular population, he was suggesting that patients would experience 12 strokes, six major and six minor, um, over a couple of years. Anticoagulation would decrease the strokes in 100 patients to four, eight fewer strokes, four strokes, four fewer strokes that are major, four that are minor. And Dr. Devereux asked his patients and his clinicians, how many bleeds would you accept in 100 patients, serious gastrointestinal bleeds, and still be willing to administer or use anticoagulation. Any questions about that dilemma? How many bleeds would you accept in 100 patients to go to prevent eight strokes, four major and four minor? How many bleeds would you accept and still use anticoagulation? Um, to have this question answered, Dr. Devereux presented to his patients. They had to clearly understand what a stroke was and understand what a bleed was. And so he described minor strokes in the way that you see in the slide, and he described major strokes in the way that you see, see on the slide. These are, um, I think, reasonable descriptions of a major and minor strokes. He also, gave them a description of what it is like to have a serious gastrointestinal bleed, uh, which included the fact um, that you are seriously ill, but that you stay in hospital in one week and feel well at the end of your hospital stay, which of course contrasts with a stroke, uh, which gives a lifetime of disability, particularly if it's a major stroke. So again, Having understood what a stroke and what a GI bleed are, he asked patients and physicians if the, hey, you had anticoagulation that would reduce strokes from 12 to four, eight fewer strokes, four major and minor, and asked how many bleeds would you accept? What do you think? How many bleeds would you accept for, to prevent eight strokes? Would you accept five or fewer, six to 10, 11 to 15, 16 to 20, or over 20. Think for a second, how many bleeds would you accept in 100 patients to reduce strokes by eight 
four major and four minor. Well, here is what happened when Dr. Devereux asked 63 physicians and 61 patients. The physicians had a very flat distribution, which means lots of disagreement. Some said fewer than five, some five to 10, some 10 to 15, some 15 to 20, and small number over 20. So very wide disagreement among physicians. When I've asked this question at many uh, grand rounds and other such settings over the years in different places, I've replicated Dr. Devereux's findings about physicians repeatedly. What about the patients? Patients are very different. Two thirds of the patients are ready to accept 22 bleeds to prevent eight strokes. Why 22? Because Dr. Devereux, when he made his survey, was thinking like a physician. He didn't think anybody would choose more than 22. They would have had he given them the chance. But although the majority of the patients are far more stroke averse and far less bleeding averse than are the physicians, there are some patients who are at the other end, who are very reluctant to accept even a small number of bleeds and have values and preferences closer to the physicians. What are the messages here? Wide disagreement about values and preferences among the physicians, the physicians being dramatically different on average than the patients, the patients being much more stroke averse and much less bleeding averse, and uh, but some patients being, like the physicians, more bleeding averse and less stroke averse. The messages are, to me, this highlights vividly, evidence will not tell you what to do. The patients who are very stroke averse will accept a substantial level of bleeding to reduce their risk of stroke. The patients at the other end will not, and for sure, we should be listening to the patient's values and preferences and not those of the physicians. So um, the uh, messages so far are three key principles of evidence-based medicine. Some evidence is more trustworthy than others, and evidence-based medicine provides clear guidance to the most trustworthy. In a simple hierarchy that Dave Sack had suggested that I show, have shown you, and in a more complicated hierarchy that you're going to hear about shortly. Best clinical care requires systematic summaries of the best available evidence. You'll see how prior to those systematic review, the extent, the wide extent of disagreement become experts, experts 10 years behind the evidence, experts contradicting the evidence. And finally, the third, perhaps somewhat ironic, uh, principle of evidence-based medicine, evidence never by itself is sufficient. Decisions require consideration of patient values and preferences. So another thing that Brian Haynes introduced was took advantage of the information revolution. He was the guy who came up with the idea of structured abstracts. You now see the journal abstracts used to be, uh, if you go back 20 or five or 30 years, used to be completely chaotic. Uh, they all had a different structure. Now you see a consistent structure. For instance, randomized trial abstracts are always reported the same way everywhere. And Brian Haynes was the one who was primarily responsible. Brian Haynes also started uh, or played a major role in evidence updates. And uh, most of you, many of you, may be receiving regular evidence updates in your area of specialty. If you are not, I suggest you should. What kind of information do we need in updates? Well, we need the latest evidence, but clinicians also need direct guidance in the form of clinical practice guidelines, which are now widely used by physicians all over the world. And the next individual I'd like to introduce you to relevant to practice guidelines is Andy Oxman, who trained with us at McMaster, was my colleague for a decade, and now works in Norway. 
And Andy had the idea of what became the great approach to judging confidence or certainty in evidence from systematic reviews and an approach to move from evidence to recommendations and judge the strength of the recommendations. This great approach was first published in the BMJ in 2004. And in 2008, the BMJ published a six part series uh, explaining uh, the great approach to clinicians. 2011, the great approach, um, uh, we took on uh, presenting details about how to apply the great approach to systematic review authors uh, and to clinical, uh, to clinical guideline authors and a series of articles now still now over 30 have appeared in the Journal of Clinical Epidemiology, giving detailed guidance about how to use GRADE. Well, we're pretty happy with the uptake. Uh, there have been uh, over 110 organizations who have adopted GRADE, including the World Health Organization, the American Thoracic Society, American College of Physicians, the Cochrane Collaboration, and perhaps most important, the world's largest, most uh, prestigious, most used electronic uh, source of information up to date, which has over 10,000 graded recommendations. So what is the great approach to quality or certainty of evidence? Those are synonyms. GRADE has four categories of evidence, high, moderate, low, and very low. Randomized trials start as high quality or certainty of evidence, but they don't necessarily stay that way. If studies are, if the studies in systematic reviews uh, addressing a particular question are unconcealed, unblinded, or lose large numbers of patients to follow up and are thus have serious risk of bias, that's going to lower the quality or our certainty in the evidence. If the results are inconsistent from study to study and we can't explain it, we will lose certainty in the evidence. If the evidence is indirect, so for instance, I practice as a secondary care general internist. I am on the wards right at the moment. Some of my patients are over 90 years of age. I try to base my practice on the results of randomized trials, but when it comes to my patients over 90, I am not so sure because very few such patients were enrolled in the trials that I use to guide my care. The trials in younger patients provide indirect evidence for my very old patients. Imprecision, small sample sizes in the studies, wide confidence intervals, and finally, publication bias. These are five categories of reasons that may lower our uh, certainty of evidence. Observational studies start as low certainty evidence. But think for a second, is there anything that you do in your clinical practice that you're sure works even though there aren't randomized trials? Well, I would suggest things like Resuscitating patients after a cardiac arrest. If you used to, used to be everybody when they were dead, they were dead. Nowadays, we bring a few back to life, even fewer to productive life, but sometimes to productive life. People used to, uh, 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 bad renal failure was a death sentence. Now we have dialysis. Uh, people with bad hip osteoarthritis, were destined to uh, progressive disability with no rescue. We can now rescue them with hip replacements. These are all situations in which we don't and shouldn't have randomized trials. Why not? Because the effects are very large and quick. Everybody or almost everybody used to do badly. Now, some, and in some cases, lots of people do well. We have high certainty, it's high quality evidence, even though we don't have randomized trials. There are not a lot of such situations, but they do exist. This is uh, what we call a uh, grade even, a summary of findings table. And grade summary of findings tables present the data 
in this case from, for IL-6 inhibitors in patients with serious or critical COVID illness. Actually, sorry, um, uh, one of the ones I have is IL-6. This is one, this is one with baricitinib. So as it so, here, let's look at the first flow, which is baricitinib's effect on mortality. Um, first, relative effects, 38% relative odds reduction, confidence interval from 56 to 15%, based on data from over 2,500 patients in three randomized trials. Next column, the absolute effects in serious or critically ill patients with COVID, 13% mortality, baricitinib applying that relative effect will reduce it to 85, that's our best estimate, 4.5% or 45 fewer per thousand deaths with a confidence interval from 68 to 17 fewer. Moderate certainty evidence, in this case because of an ongoing trial, and a plain language statement Baricitinib probably reduces mortality in patients with severe or critical COVID. The other rows in this uh, summary of findings table give the same relative effect, absolute effect, certainty of evidence, and a plain language statement about mechanical ventilation, adverse effects, and hospital length of stay. This is the great approach to presenting evidence summaries summary of findings table providing relative effects, absolute effects, certainty of evidence, and a plain language summary. So I've talked about um, Braid's approach to rating certainty of evidence. And I mentioned, I'm gonna go back for a second, I mentioned that Dave Sackett suggested a simple hierarchy of evidence. This is the new hierarchy of evidence. This new hierarchy of evidence, randomized trials start as high, but we now have reasons for rating down, even as low as very low. Observational studies start as low, but we have reasons for rating up. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is a much more sophisticated hierarchy of evidence than the one that we used to use. But we're now moving from grades way of looking at evidence to GRADE's approach to going from evidence to recommendations. GRADE has two categories of recommendations only, strong and weak recommendations. Some guideline panels don't like to make weak recommendations. So the World Health Organization, for instance, will never make a weak recommendation. They have strong recommendations or conditional recommendations. However, it means the same thing two categories of recommendations. Sometimes you'll see weak, sometimes you'll see conditional. They mean the same thing. You give a strong recommendation, a panel gives a strong recommendation if the benefits clearly outweigh the downsides or the downsides clearly outweigh the benefits. What may make a guideline panel downgrade the strength of the recommendation from strong to weak or conditional? There are a number of things, but the two key ones are low confidence in the evidence. If you're not sure of the benefits or you're not sure of the downsides, very difficult to be sure that the benefits outweigh the downsides or vice versa. The other reason is you are, you have moderate or high certainty evidence, but there is a close balance between the desirable and undesirable outcomes. And so people with different values and preferences, remember Dr. Devereux's study, people do have very different values and preferences will make different choices when there's a close balance between desirable and undesirable outcomes. So this great approach of strong and weak recommendations, we like it because it has clear implications. We panels will make a strong recommendation when they consider what, hap what would happen if you had fully informed individuals and you presented them with the choice. If all or almost all would make the same choice, we would have a strong recommendation. If choice would vary because of a relatively close trade-off between benefits and downsides and because of differences in values and preferences, the panel will make a weak choice. 
and that has direct implications for interaction with the patient. A strong recommendation, you don't need to go through a extensive shared decision-making exercise because if a guideline panel has got it right, all or almost all patients going through such an exercise would make the same choice. A weak recommendation does mandate shared decision-making because patients uh, will, to an appreciable extent, vary in their choices. Use of a decision aid, strong recommendation may be a waste of time. Weak recommendation decision aids can help you with your shared decision making. And finally, strong recommendation is a candidate for a quality of care criteria. A weak recommendation when the right thing to do differs across patients is not a good candidate for a quality of care criteria. So, Guidelines must consider uh, values and preferences, but they can only consider average values and preferences. At the point of care, you can target a, uh, uh, a target for the individual patient, ensure that the decision is consistent with that individual patient's values and preferences. And I will introduce you now to Victor Montori. Victor Montori. Uh, also trained with us at McMaster, uh, so prior to returning to the Mayo Clinic, where he is a professor of medicine and a leader in decision aids and in patient values and preferences at the point of care. So, um, the, the Victor is an endocrinologist, and uh, he does a lot of work with diabetes. And he likes to do shared decision making with his patients with diabetes. And he's come up with what I think is a brilliant strategy for so doing. He has these cards, and you can see now there's lots of uh, alternatives for diabetes treatment. And he asks patients, what would you like to know about, about in choosing between these treatments? Would you like to know about the risk of hypoglycemia, about how much blood sugar you're going to be reduced, your daily routine, your daily sugar testing and cost, and another that's at the top of the screen, but we can't, I, at least I can't see it um, at the moment, uh, which is, uh, let's see if we can go, weight change. There's weight change. So of all these possibilities, what do you think, the, so you'll say to the patient, what would, what would you like to look at first? What do you think is the, uh, the most chosen, what's the most first chosen of these? Anybody have a suggestion? We'll go down again so that you can see weight change, low blood sugar, blood, uh, the extent of reduction in blood sugar, daily routine, daily sugar testing costs. What's the most popular first choice? Anybody have a suggestion? You see the money. Money cost, that is uh, definitely a possibility. Any other suggestion? Sorry? Uh, weight change. Yeah, that turns, Victor tells me that the most popular first choice is weight change. Up to 40% of the people say, first tell me about weight change. And they may then go to daily routine. They may then go to cost. And they may eventually ask for all six, but they almost never do. Victor tells me that they sometimes go as far as four, usually two or three. They are ready to make their choice. So this is a very efficient way to do shared decision making, to have the patients focus on what they think is most important in choosing their treatment. So uh, the next person I'd like to tell you about, Per van Wyk, is a Norwegian who studied with us for a year before returning to his native country. And he has made a big contribution to optimizing guidelines. Per, when he was with us, um, uh, participated in the last iteration, the ninth iteration of the American College of Chest Physicians 
guidelines for antithrombotic therapy, which I chaired and we were proud of, uh, uh, used grade, used grade very nicely, but its presentation in PDS was not that attractive. You had to either turn your head or rotate, for instance, to see this particular summary. And Pear said, well, these might be nice guidelines, but are they available, useful, and understandable for clinicians? Maybe not particularly. Are they suited for integration into electronic medical records, EBM textbooks, and adaptation? Certainly not. Are they sufficiently up to date? As a matter of fact, they're published and then they aren't updated. This one was actually never updated by the American College of Chest Physicians. And after, a, after even a few months, some of the recommendations were updated. If you wait a couple of years, many of them. Do they facilitate shared decision-making? Not at all. So Pear then said, how to make grade irresistible? How to do, how to produce guidelines that are actually meet all these characteristics that I described above? And he said, to achieve this, we need magic. Magic, in this case, means making grade the irresistible choice. Um, what um, Pear then initiated was, it was, he clearly recognized that guidelines needed to be presented much better than they were, and they also needed rapid updating. And he, in an alliance with the British Medical Journal, started BMJ Rapid Recommendations. This is the introduction to BMJ Rapid Recommendations that appeared in September of 2016. And since then, BMJ has been producing these rapid recommendations when new practice-changing evidence is available. In terms of meeting the needs of clinicians using guidelines and the complete uh, hopelessness of P reading PDFs, um, uh, Pear and his colleagues in the Making Grade the Irresistible Choice group constructed a guideline, an electronic guideline authoring tool, the principle of which rests analogous to Lego blocks. You start with a recommendation. And if you want, you can find out key additional key information and the rationale. You can look at descriptive tables like the summary of finding table, or you can even go back to the individual studies. So it's a layered database where if all you want is the recommendation. You can get it and stop there, and you can peel back the layers. And that allows you to put these guidelines on any computer, including your smartphones, to have them integrated into the medical record, to have them efficiently adapted, and to help create semi-automatic decisions, create semi-automatically decision aids for clinicians. And the pair's colleague, Thomas Agaritsis, um, has um, led the uh, one aspect of the magic endeavor is these semi-automated uh, production of decision aids. And why can we do it? First of all, because now we have systematic reviews structured on grade principles. So the format and structure of all the systematic reviews is the same. And then you have what I described to you as Victor's incredible insight. And as many incredible insights, as soon as you see somebody have it, you think, well, isn't that obvious? But nobody thought of it before, which is, we don't have to tell patients about all the evidence and all the outcomes. We can let them choose what outcomes they think are more important and let them make their decisions after only showing one, two, or three uh, the impact of interventions and one or two or three outcomes, making shared decision-making much more efficient. And then the magic app uh, and the technology allows the semi-automated production of decision aids, which I will show you. 
I'm now going to end off the last section of this talk, which talks about evidence-based medicine in the era of COVID. And what we have, we, we have had a real challenge, but a crucial challenge that we have the, the treatments for COVID appearing very rapidly, some of which have proved completely useless even after being hyped like hydro hydroxychloroquine and some that are quite effective including cor uh, corticosteroids, IL-6 inhibitors, baricitinib, uh, nermatrovir, uh, uh, pirivir, a whole bunch of them. And we needed to quickly differentiate the ones that are actually effective from the ones that are ineffective. And what we needed was not only a meta-analysis, but a network meta-analysis that can simultaneously compare all these treatments. Reed Semenchuk and uh, Romina Brignardello, whose photos you see in the right side of this slide, who work with us at McMaster University, brilliant young people who took on the enormous challenge of processing up to 20 new randomized trials per week, updating them, uh, getting their risk of bias assessments, getting the data abstracted, and ultimately conducting the network meta-analysis to see the effect of the interventions. And this network meta-analysis informs World Health Organization recommendations for uh, COVID. And these World Health Organization recommendations appear in the British Medical Journal as part of the BMJ Rapid Recommendation Series. Uh, rapid production of the recommendations uh, when new evidence becomes available. And if all goes well, I am now going to be able to show you um, how this works. So with a mouse click uh, just now, I have gone to the World Health Organization Living Guidelines, and we will go and show you what this is like. So um, I think I will pick, uh, there's a whole list uh, for all the treatments, and a good one to Gordon, show you. I, we cannot see the... Uh, what a tragedy. What a tragedy. I thought with the sharing of the screen that it would work because I see it. I see it and you guys don't. Any, um, uh, well, uh, I'm, I really... You can grab the tab and move it to the presentation site and maybe that will appear or you can share the online tab. Okay, let's see. Can I, let, let me copy this. Well, let's see. What if we do it this way? Uh, so it usually works. I'm sad that it hasn't, but we will see if we can make it work here because I'd really like to show you this. Okay. Uh, let me copy it. How come it won't let me copy it? Do, do you have the tab open? Um, I I have I can I can open it again very quickly if I go here. Maybe in share If I hit on this, okay. So I presume I'm I I have the tab open now. Okay. So what so... would you, what would you suggest? You can in share, you can share only the tab or- How do I do that? Well, I'll stop the... sharing. Maybe this, I'll stop sharing and I'll share yep. again. And let's see, where is the tab on the screen now? Um, here we are. Now, can you see it? Okay should be seeing World Health Organization. Yep, now we see it. Ah, brilliant, okay. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you, Louise. But I've never figured out myself. Okay, very good. Nice to know for the future that I can do it. Okay, I'm going to go to, see there's all these recommendations, neutralizing antibodies, monoclonal, uh, 
Rooks, uh, another of these, I can't even pronounce them. Anyway, Barasitinib. We're going to go to Barasitinib, and we immediately go, and you see a strong recommendation. We recommend treatment with Barasitinib. Um, then some additional guidance. Corticosteroids or IL-6 inhibitor blockers can be administered in combination. So that would be a key thing. Now, if you want, uh, if you want, okay, uh, I'm going to go back and maybe I will just do this. With, there we go. Okay. So you want to know about the research evidence. You click here and you get to one of our summary of findings table. Remember the summary of findings table, mortality, mechanical ventilation. You can go if you want to the summary of findings table. If you can find out what we call the evidence to decision framework, it summarizes information about benefits and harms, certainty of evidence, values and preference, resource implications. If you want, you can then go, what is the justification? Here's how the panel justifies its recommendation. You can go to practical information. You find out about the root dosage and duration, dose regimen adjustment, practical issues. And you can go to a decision aid, varicitinib versus standard care. And you can say, okay, our patients want to, patients wants to know about mortality. Well, it's going to reduce mortality from 13 to 110 as our best estimate. And we think it's high certainty evidence. And if our patients are somewhat challenged numerically, you can show them this figure, which has a thousand uh, uh, icons for a thousand patients. And you can see that 130, the total number at the top, 130 will die without baricitinib, uh, 110 with baricitinib, and these colored ones are the 20 difference in 1,000, the 20 people who would not otherwise, um, who will die. So um, that is, so you can see this layered approach which is, we believe, this is how gu all guidelines should be presented, where if all you want is the recommendation, you get just get the recommendation. If you want information, if you want to see a summary of findings table, uh, if you want to see practical considerations, if you want to see the rationale, if you want a decision aid, it is all available to you. So I'm going to stop sharing. I will then... Uh, can I go back to sharing whoops uh, sorry about that I did not want to go back here wanted to go back to my slides um, so we are seeing the who you're seeing website. the slides now no the who website okay that's not what I want to do now I, and you can close that window and i'm going uh, to stop uh, hang on i will stop sharing i'm going to share again sorry for my technical incompetence here and i will go back no and share this okay now you see the slides again right uh, uh wait a minute i'll let you know in a moment uh yes we, we see the slides now okay good well not a too big a deal because i'm almost finished and indeed um, uh, my final slide is about evidence-based medicine in the time of COVID, unprecedented rapid production of evidence, uh, randomized trials rapidly produced, some of them very good, particularly in platform trials like recovery, solidarity, and remat cap, unprecedented cooperation among trials. So the WHO is uh, succeeded in getting trialists to share information before conventional publications. And the living net network meta-analysis that I described to you and got the guidelines that I've shown you in this electronic magic platform, which are just a huge advance over prior presentation of guidelines. Um, finally, 
I will note if anybody wants to know more about evidence-based medicine, we have our user's guides to the medical literature, a manual, which is very complete, and a uh, essentials, which is much more uh, targeted. And finally, if anybody wants to find out about the latest of what's happening in evidence-based medicine, uh, I tweet regularly uh, with my notions of the latest and greatest about evidence-based medicine. So I will stop sharing now, and I am happy to entertain any questions or comments or reflections from anybody who's watching online or anybody who is in the room with you there, Luis. Okay, Igor, thank you so much for your lecture. Let me see if anyone has a question in the room or if you have a question online, please let us know, write it in the chat. Si tienen alguna duda, por favor, escríbanla en el chat. ¿Alguna duda que le quieran preguntar algo? Igor, you tweet something yesterday about critical appraisal that you okay, think so... that critical appraisal is not something that every clinician must do, do okay you think so, that is... yeah okay um uh, love to talk about that because uh teachers of evidence-based medicine uh need i think to get the message and they've been slow about getting the message because my, my message actually goes back to in 1990 i started as director of the internal medicine residency program at mcmaster university and in doing that I thought I was going to teach every resident to read the methods and results of studies and then to interpret the methods and results of studies and apply it to their patients. After seven years, I concluded that very few are going to have the skills to do a good job of reading the methods and results of uh, the studies. Um, and what clinicians, so uh, very few clinicians are ever going to be doing critical appraisal of the original studies. What they are going to be relying on, I believe, is the sort of guidelines that I've talked about here, and ideally guidelines, ideally structured in the future with the electronic systems that I just described to you that we're doing with the WHO guidelines. Um, in, uh, uh, so what should we teach them? about evidence-based medicine. We should teach them to recognize that there can be high, moderate, low, or very low certainty evidence. Sometimes we are sure of things and sometimes we are not. And we have a structure, the great approach that allows trustworthy assessment of whether the evidence is high, moderate, low, or very low. And then clinicians need to be able to understand the results if they're gonna do shared decision-making with their patients. They need to understand what relative and absolute effects are, and they need to be able to interpret those for the patients. And the decision aids that we are producing may help them do that. But they need to understand the result. They need to understand the concept of certainty of evidence and what it means, and they need to understand the results. And that, not critical appraisal, should be the focus of our teaching of evidence-based medicine. Okay. Only my, my only concern about that is how we can make everybody comfortable with accepting, not understanding how everything was created. Now that is a super point, okay? And if you think of, um, uh, if you think of many things, you may, uh, maybe at some stage in medical training, you understood the pharmacology of the drugs you were giving. And um, probably most of us don't remember that anymore, but we know that underlies the way of the drugs that we give act. It's the same here. So I still teach. I start out by going through risk of bias criteria and concealment and blinding and loss to follow up. And when we come to a systematic review, I tell them about a structured clinical question and a comprehensive search and so on. And when I go to grade, I tell them about risk of bias and consistency and indirectness. But I do it all quite quickly. Um, I do it, and the purpose of doing it is not to teach it 
so that the clinicians will be able to do that subsequently, but rather exactly as you say, that they say, oh, I understand. This is actually a process that is well worked out, that has a strong scientific basis, and that they are going to be able to trust. And uh, then not so you do it yourself, as in many things, we know somebody's doing it, we believe we can trust it, and so the output of that, which is high, moderate, low, and very low certainty of evidence, and the summaries of the magnitudes of effect, we can believe it. So you've got an excellent point. I think we have to teach it so that clinicians can understand that this is a well worked out process that people who know what they're doing can produce trustworthy evidence summaries for them. So it's a great point. And I, so I still teach it, but my emphasis has shifted way over to understanding the results and the whole notion of certainty of evidence. Okay, wonderful. Uh, let me see if uh, any has a question. Alguien tiene alguna pregunta que quieran escribir en el chat o alguna pregunta que quieran hacer ahora? Gordon, the uh, one of the attending is asking about the precision medicine and if he's going to replace. Um, yeah, if we're going to replace like uh, multicentric uh, clinical practice trials, like. So what um, the, um, there may be situations when you don't need randomized trials. Um, and so um, the, the ones that I have told you about, resuscitation after cardiac arrest, hip replacement and so on. If you have a, um, if you have, if you identify a gene that means that 100% of the people, if you give a treatment, as we now know, they will have a very bad reaction and you test it out and everybody has a bad reaction, you don't need a randomized trial. You don't give the drug to those people. If you identify a subgroup where everybody has a large effect, you don't need a randomized trial. But so far, um, uh, uh, most of my, you can see in your own clinical practice, how often have I, did they identified that? Not very often. You're still going to see situations in which um, you identify people who are more likely to do something or less likely to do something, but you're not too sure, in which case you'll still need randomized trials. So um, it, it's absolutely clear now how many instances in do, do, you, or do people actually practice precision medicine where they know exactly what to do in the individual patients that differ that differs from the next patient they see? Almost never. So um, it's, it, 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 it's going to have a role but the conventional ways of establishing the benefits and harms of our therapies are not going to change. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have only one minute left, so anyone has another question? Alguien tiene alguna pregunta en línea que quieran escribir? There is one more question. What do you think about the future? AI will be part, a big part, or what do you think about the future of implementing? Okay. okay. So AI will never help us with the how, what treatments work and what treatments don't work, because AI allows. Uh, uh, AI relies on large observational databases, which have problems in the data they collect and has the same problems as any observational studies. Um, the, the, uh, you have confounding, you have the people who receive the treatment are different from the people who don't receive it, and AI will never figure that out. So we are still going to, uh, AI just has the same place it's one way of looking at observational studies, but it doesn't change. 
Where AI will be helpful is with prognostic models. So you can get very large databases that create um, probably more trustworthy prognostic models than traditional regression approaches. Within the world of, uh, uh, within the world of EBM, uh, you will have AI produced prognostic models, but that's the only place that I, I can see that it will really have an important role. But do you believe that technology will be more like supportative in taking decisions like like something like in the movies that you see uh, uh, the technology help, helping you in the moment like beyond the AI world? Well, yes. And um, I would say the WHO guidelines that I showed you are exactly, we need to embed that in our, um, in our electronic medical records. And so it will help you in the moment. It will quickly get you to the recommendation. And if you want support for that recommendation, it will quickly immediately get you to the evidence. And if you now want a decision aid with your patient, it will immediately get you to the decision aid. That is the technology. Yes, I, I definitely. And we have it now. We've just got to get it implemented. OK. Thank you so much, Gord. I think we have passed two minutes from your time. Thank you so much for your lecture. Okay, wonderful. thanks very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Enjoy the rest of your meeting. Bye for now. See you soon, Gord. Muchas gracias a todos los asistentes. Espero que hayan disfrutado la plática. Y pues si tienen algún comentario, pues tienen el correo para hacer alguna pregunta o contactarnos. Muchas gracias a todos.